Welcome to Uplook's Summer Bible Program. We're studying 16 key salvation terms. Today's lesson, the ingredients of true salvation, grace. One of the beautiful benedictions from the pen of the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5 says this, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. We've been thinking about some of the building blocks of salvation, some of the essential ideas that the Word of God gives us to show us what the Apostle calls the unsearchable riches of God's grace, the blessings upon blessings, all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. When we think about the subject of grace, um, we see it in at least three distinct aspects. First of all, there is the condition of the heart of God uh, moving in goodwill towards sinners. God by his nature is gracious. You have tasted and seen that the Lord is gracious. And so graciousness is this uh, loyalty to his creatures, this desire to seek their good. Uh, his attitude toward them is not one of anger or of upset, frustration, uh, but God is gracious. And this attitude of God towards the human race has been manifested over and over and over again no wonder we love to sing that world all-time favorite hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So first of all, grace is the condition of the heart of God, an attribute of God. Here he's called the God of all grace. And then secondly, there is the practical extending of kindness towards the human race, the word charis, uh, is sometimes translated gift and sometimes grace. And that's the idea, a gift, a gracious gift, undeserved, unmerited. God reaches out to the human race. And so he not only has this sense of loyalty to the human race and his desire to bless them, but he actively pursues this, in fact, answering sometimes before we ask and uh, giving us more than we deserve. In fact, the scripture says that he gives abundantly above all that we ask or think. And then thirdly, the benefits received uh, are received through grace. In other words, as I come to God and receive his beneficence, I can't come at demanding from him. I can't do it a deserving of him. All that I receive must be received through grace. And so God is gracious in his heart toward me. He's gracious in his gifts, and it's only by grace that I can respond and receive these wonderful gifts. Maybe you've heard the little acrostic, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. And as we turn to the Word of God and, and look up this subject of grace, God in his kindness has allowed us to see grace over against certain other commodities that, uh, that show up its contrast. And so there are four of these. Uh, grace is put over against works in Ephesians chapter 2. These are well-known verses um, where we read that, that God's grace towards us uh, is the only means by which we may draw near to him. We cannot come deservingly, um, he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so here, grace is contrasted with works. It's dealing here with the source of salvation. Does salvation come through my performance or through God's provision? The large majority of the religious world thinks that the way that they merit heaven, that they enter into heaven, is through their own efforts. Praying, paying, um, good works, whatever it might be, 
they feel somehow that, that redemption is merit-based. Well, it is merit-based, but it's based on the merits of the Lord Jesus. It's based on the finished work of Christ. It's a completed work. It's not something that we're called on to do. And he tells us why, that it is not of works lest anyone should boast. We have this bad habit of taking credit to ourselves. And God thinks his son deserves all the credit. And so here we see this contrast between grace as the basis of salvation and not works. So that the provision, the source of salvation, is from God's gracious gift of Christ and through Christ the gift of eternal life, not through our own works, especially because we would be able then to boast. But all the choir in heaven, no one says I did it myself or I helped Jesus to do it. We all sing, not unto us, but unto thy name, give the glory. And then secondly, uh, over in Romans chapter 4, we have another contrast between grace and this time debt. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 4 we read, Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So the second contrast is between grace and debt. This has to do with the claim of salvation. Do I owe God? Does God owe me? Well, the fact is that I owe God. I owe God for every breath I breathe, every mouthful of food I eat, every second of time, every conscious thought. It all comes from God. He's the giver of every good gift. And so the idea that somehow I could stand before God someday and tell him, you owe me a place in heaven? No, no, says Paul. We owe God an eternal debt of gratitude for his grace. But he does not owe us an eternal home in heaven. It's, it's an altogether false basis of a relationship with God to tell God that since I took a little bit of what he gave me and turned it back into good works or gifts to the church, that somehow that now has put him into my debt and he owes me a place in heaven. And then thirdly, we have a contrast between grace and what Adam did through his offense in the next chapter. Romans chapter 5 and uh, verse 15 says, But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace of the one man, Jesus, abounded to many. And so here Paul is contrasting what Adam did through his offense that led to many offenses, many trespasses. That down through the course of history, uh, th this planet has expended itself in doing things that are contradictory to the will of God. Lawlessness abounds. But thanks be to God, high and beyond the abounding of man's sin is the abounding of God's grace. No matter how many sins a person is guilty of, there's grace and to spare. There's more than enough. For man's sin is linked to his own limitations. God's grace is unbounded. God, who is infinite, has infinite grace, enough for every sinner. And then finally, in Galatians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul contrasts grace and law. And here he's speaking about the rule of life for those who have been saved. And he explains to us that the rule of life is not based on law keeping. It is based on the grace of God. Verse 21 of chapter 2 says, I do not set aside the grace of God. If righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Christ did not die to save us so that we could be put back into bondage to the law. He saved us so we could be set free from the law and come into a new law, the law of love, the law of life 
through the Spirit in Christ Jesus. There was nothing wrong with the law, but there was something wrong with me. And says Paul, actually the, the law made me a worse sinner than I otherwise was. My sinful nature was irritated and stimulated to sin. And God says, I'm not going to have my people struggling under this law system that condemns them but doesn't give them power to live. Instead, I'm going to make a new covenant and write it on their hearts and minds, and I'm going to set them free from that so that now it's out of love to me, the only fitting motive, according to 1 Corinthians 13, of the child of God. So yes, there are consequences when Christians sin, but we are treated now as children, not as criminals, and there is no condemnation to those in Christ. So this beautiful characteristic of God, this gracious spirit, this desire to bless, this super abounding blessing. And we notice every time we read about his grace, we read about the superlatives of his grace, the, the riches of his grace, uh, the manifold grace of God, the grace upon grace that he has given to us. God lavishes his grace upon us, all undeserved. And in exchange, as we began reading with Peter's beautiful benediction, the grace of God comes down upon us and glory goes back to God. God deserves the glory and we receive the grace. Undeserved grace, deserved glory. And may God help us in this week to take advantage of his grace, to live in the good of his grace, the graciousness of God that lavishes upon us everything we need to live happy, useful, successful Christian lives. May we rest on that. And he tells us that his grace is sufficient for us. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. God help us to delight in the God of all grace, to take advantage of his graciousness, to live in the good of his blessings, and to manifest grace to one another and to those around us to show people the characteristics of the God that we love and serve. Well, welcome back to this series of studies on uh, the key words of salvation. And uh, we've now come into the second set of four words that have to do with how a person gets in on the good of salvation. How are we actually saved? And our first word is grace. So David has some good questions for us. Hopefully we'll find some good answers in the Word of God. Our first question uh, is does grace make the law of God obsolete? Good question. A lot of people are confused on this matter, I think. And uh, the Apostle Paul, in writing to the Romans, in uh, chapter 10 and verse 4, says very clearly, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now Paul's going to go on to explain that through grace, it's possible now for the believer to fulfill the righteousness of the law without actually being under the law. And I think it's important to make that distinction. Uh, again, writing to the Galatian believers in chapter 2 and verse 19, he says uh, that th I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. When we look at the law, we realize the law was perfect. Nothing wrong with the law. And one of the huge benefits of looking at the law is that it is a declaration of the righteousness of God. It's a revelation of who God is. And in addition to that, uh, the Bible tells us that it is a tool, a mechanism, to bring people to Christ. It's like a teacher that shows them their desperate need and reveals to them their need of a Savior. And so it's very helpful in that way. In another way, it's also given to us 
as an understanding of the character of God and how he deals with people. In other words, he takes us seriously. He takes what we do seriously. He doesn't simply say, well, they couldn't help themselves. I'm not on the level of a jellyfish. I make real choices and God holds me responsible. And so the law is an expression of that fact that God takes man seriously. So does that mean that there are no commands in the New Testament for the believer? Yeah, good point. A lot of people are confused on this matter. Mm -hmm. If we can lay it out on the board like this, we have the idea that a command plus penalty equals the law and no power to live it. So uh, the, the law was a package of legislation that included in it the penalty. That's why Paul says to the Galatians, if you bring people back under the law, you're also bringing them under the curse of the law if they break it. You can't turn it into suggestions. So uh, this is the law, command plus penalty, if you break it, uh, no power to live it. Whereas this wonderful new principle of grace is command. The New Testament is chock full of commands. It's command plus power to live it and no penalty if you break it. And that is so key so that now I, I'm no longer being treated as a criminal. I am now being dealt with as a son. And so there are consequences, there's child training, there's discipline, but there's no penalty. Christ bore the penalty. The penalty is gone now. And so grace, the principle of grace, is uh, not command plus penalty, but command plus power to live it. In the New Covenant, it's been internalized. Instead of the law being on tables of stone, external and heavy and brittle, now he says, I'm writing it on your hearts and it's pulsing with life so that the commands of the New Testament include in them the power to actually live them. Now we hear the term free grace. Is grace really free? Well, yes and no. In Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, well-known verses we read, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So here we see, as with every gift, uh, the recipient receives the gift freely, but the giver is the one who pays the price. And so every time I access his grace, it costs him. And we should never think of grace as cheap. We should understand that while it's free, it's very costly. about situational grace. Why does it seem that some are given more grace by God than others? So let's look into the word and see if we can find an answer to that. Uh, one of the important verses, I think, on the subject of grace is in Hebrews, in chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, where we read about our high priest who is sympathetic to us. And verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So the first obvious answer is there are some people who ask for it, who seek it. Some Christians struggle on trying to live out the Christian life in their own strength, and others say, no, I'm going to go to the throne of grace. If the Lord Jesus is sitting there ready to dispense his resources so that I can live this new life, I'll go and ask for it. And so some people have more grace just because they take advantage of his generosity, uh, grace upon grace. Second reason, I think, is that there are Christians who choose to live graciously. And as we give, he gives in return. Uh, if we forgive others, we're forgiven. If we give to others, 
He compensates for this. Uh, my God shall supply all your need as we seek to give to others. So some people uh, become the channels of his grace because they're giving away grace to others. It's his grace that they're giving and he's constantly reimbursing them, if you will, or, or refilling the tank. It's just living in the good of the grace of God. I think a third reason is that we all have different responsibilities. The Apostle Paul said, according to the gift, so is the grace. And so if I have a heavier responsibility, I may need more grace to do that. There are good reasons to see that God is very gracious and very generous with his grace. We need to take advantage of it to use it for his glory. Thanks for that. And we need to make sure that we don't confuse God's grace and material blessing. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll get into that with this next question. Grace goes beyond saving a wretch like me. How should grace guide our thinking as Christians? Great question. So we're not just saved by grace, we're to live by grace. In fact, the Apostle Paul starts almost every one of his epistles with these words, grace to you. And Romans is no different. And then as we go through the book of Romans, we see not only that we receive this gift of salvation by grace through faith, but we notice in chapter five, for example, where he says in verse two, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So Paul is saying, I know you know how to live the Christian life, because that's how you received this new life. You received it by simply taking God at his word. And so now the life of faith is a matter of going on to take God at his word. And as we do that, he provides the grace not only to save us, but the grace to live this new Christian experience. If we turn over to chapter six and verse one, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound. Now at the end of chapter 5 he's explained that as sin reigned to death even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life. So we understand the role of grace not only in saving us from the penalty of sin but ongoing in saving us from the influence of sin in our daily experience. But as he points out that while we need daily grace in dealing with sin uh, we shouldn't use it as license to sin. We should always treat it as a precious commodity because it costs the precious blood of Christ to provide that. We go over to chapter 6 and verse 4 and we read, we have been brought into this newness of life, to walk in newness of life. And uh, the Apostle Paul says a surprising thing here. In verse 14 he says, sin shall not have dominion over you for and we might in our minds fill in the blank by saying sin doesn't have dominion over you if you read your Bible, if you attend church services, if you pray. But what he says is that sin shall not have dominion over you because you are not under law but under grace. And so the idea that now God is not standing over you with a big stick, that as a gracious father he has sent his spirit to provide everything we need to live a new kind of life, that he's not our judge anymore, he's our friend, and he's standing by to help us, uh, this should liberate us from the clutch of sin on our lives because now we've been brought into a new realm, the law of love, where we do things for him through love that we would never be forced to do through the law. And I think I'd finish off by speaking about the path of humility where the way up is down and you know the grace of our Lord Jesus that though he was rich yet for your sakes he became poor, he humbled himself. So says Peter, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God because God gives grace to the humble but he resists the proud. And we live in a society in the West that's full of pride and we need to 
rediscover this principle that the path of the child of God is one of self-humbling, uh, following the path of the Lord Jesus. And for that, we need his grace to do that. So those are some areas where grace has a very practical effect in the life of the believer. Well, thank you once again for your time uh, in answering the questions. Uh, make sure that you like the video and uh, leave comments with questions. Remember, we're hoping to collect some questions and to have our own video just dealing with the uh, questions that we receive. Subscribe as we uh, continue through our series, and uh, we look forward to our next videos.